Good Coalition, and this is our talk on difference. Um, we're really glad that you're here. We were started in 2013 after the floods, and we worked on a ton of projects uh, related to flood restoration, 14 big ones uh, with over $4 million in grant funding to complete those. Um, I just want to read you a little something I don't have. The coalition envisions a healthy watershed that is resilient to extreme events and provides diverse habitats for wildlife. We work towards these goals by engaging a wide variety of stakeholders to protect, restore, and improve natural resources through direct action and public education. So that's kind of our vision statement. Uh, basically, in 2019, we expanded our mission to include healthy the whole watershed, healthy forests and wildlife in addition to our healthy waterways. Uh, we're working on two really cool projects right now for fuel reduction and forest health, one above Mary's Lake and one in Boulder Mountain. We hope to continue projects like that in the future. We're also doing a really cool project with the Chini Camp um, that's wildlife, uh, rest of the love. Riparian restoration <laughs> with some simulated fever structures and some uh, really cool things happening there. So, we're excited about that. Uh, we also strive to support the wildlife in Estes Valley with our elk education outreach program. And that's during the spring calving season and the fall rut. We have volunteers that are around the lake to help visitors and viewers watch the elk safely. And um, We've got some cool talks that I'll talk about later. We are a school group of board members of the Learning Network. You can follow us on Facebook and our website. And we are funded a lot by um, grants, larger grants, but also by individual donors. And the duck race is coming <laughs> up soon. So we look forward to having you help us that way. Um, I would like to now introduce Don Wilson. I'm not going to. <laughs> um, she's an award-winning nature photographer. I met her in 2013 at Brainerd Lake while we're just sitting behind her cameras. She's a travel writer who specializes in telling stories about wildlife and Rocky Mountain destinations. She's got a cool new book, "100 Things to Do in Estes Before You Die." Um, that's for sale. You can look at it later. She's a 20-year resident in Northern Colorado, including the last six in Estes Park. She served as the president of the North American Ph Nature Photography Association, is co-host co of the Nature Photographer podcast, guides in the Estes Park area, and writes for the Trail Gazette. You can find her on Instagram at Don Wilson Photo and on her website, um, which is donwilsonphotography.com. All right. And with no or more no further ado. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a, a really good crowd. Um, so thank you for coming out. I'm glad it's tonight, not last night with the snow. So um our the weather has cooperated with us. Um have you guys this is covered now, right? This slide. So we're good to go. Perfect. Okay, apparently the down down button doesn't work. Um so we're here tonight to talk about dippers. Um, it is North America's only aquatic songbird. Um, I was playing, my apologies, I was trying to get my audio ready. So um, has anybody heard this sound when you're out hiking? Um, so this is kind of, kind of one of those things, they have such a distinct sound. And it was one of the things that kind of got me, um, got me into like just being fascinated with them. So, you know, on top of the fact that it is the only aquatic songbird. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so, so tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the natural history of dippers, talk to you a little bit about um, some of the things that are affecting dippers. You mentioned the 2013 floods, that's something that, that has definitely affected them. Um, so a little bit additional about me, um, I am a native of New Jersey. I grew up um, not far from, from the shore outside of Philadelphia in South Jersey. 
Um, moved to Colorado in 2002, so I've been out here in the mountains like most people. I fell in love with it after a visit in 97, said I'd live here, and five years later, I was one of those people that now says, this is beautiful, don't move here. So um, I studied communications in my undergrad. I have an MBA in marketing, and I've my passion has always been finding a way to com combine my creative talents of writing, photography, all the ways to tell a story, to talk about nature. Um, so, so that's kind of how I wound up where I am today. Um, and then I do a lot of writing around Colorado. I've written for Colorado Life, Colorado Outdoors. Um, as she mentioned, I write for the Trail Gazette here in town. Um, I do all of their outdoor writing. And then I do a lot of guiding as well for polar bears and brown bears. I go up to Alaska and Canada. And so, so why the dipper? Um, this is a little guy on the big Thompson river. Um, when it was frozen and cold, I was sitting on the snow. My bum was a little on the freezing side. Um, so my fascination started with dippers in Yellowstone National Park in 2010. I went on a tour um, with a group similar to Rocky Mountain Conservancy, and the guide was actually fascinated with dippers. And I had never, never seen one. And <clears throat> so, or I had never really observed or paid much attention to them because they are kind of small and nondescript and gray. And she pointed out and gave a bunch of facts about the dippers and I was just like, these are fascinating little birds. So, um, and then obviously living in Colorado, we have quite a few of them here on our waterways. So I just felt like there was something very subtle yet unique about these birds. Their sound is extremely loud because it has to carry over flowing water. Um, so just the other day I was driving down the canyon and I ha happened to have the back door, back window open for my dog. And I could hear them as I was driving. I was like, eh, brakes on, camera out. Um, so I've, I've become very tuned into them. And they do spend their entire year here in Colorado. They don't migrate. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. But that's one of the nice things. As a photographer, I can actually capture their whole year process um, because they are in the area um, throughout all the seasons. So... Um, you know, the, one of the things for a nature photographer, a wildlife photographer, we the, the animals kind of, or the subjects that we have in the wintertime get a little bit less photogenic. We get a lot of ducks here in the winter, which is phenomenal, but the elk start looking a little shaggy. Um, the moose kind of start hiding in the trees. Um, so it's a lot of fun to have a bird that is active and animated and really just kind of fascinating as a really good subject. Um, so as I mentioned, I found a dipper. This was a couple of years ago. I found this dipper in this particular spot along the Big Thompson River, and the ice was, you know, the, this thick ice. It was a super cold winter, um, kind of like what we've had this year. And he was feeding off of the side of the ice, and it made for these really cool photos because every time he tried to pick a bug up or eat a bug, you know, the snow would kind of fly off, and it was just a lot of fun. And it got me thinking, did they really spend the winters here in Colorado? This is a tiny bird. How do they stay warm? What do they, what do they eat? You know, you would think that there aren't that many things to eat in the water in the wintertime. So I really got started in, that's kind of what got me fascinated with kind of documenting their story and not just the story of wintertime or not just nesting season, but the whole story. What's the whole year look like with these birds? But I did start with nesting season. It seemed like a logical way to start, a logical time period to start. Um, and in that year, this was about three years ago, I found about 12, 12 nests that summer in various places. Some were under bridges, some were on man, other man-made structures, some were natural ones on the side of boulders, some were in, in behind waterfalls that I couldn't access. Um, some were in little creeks, some were in big rivers. So it was it was fascinating, again, to kind of see that they don't have a consistent, you know, kind of like bluebirds are always in a, a cavity or a nest box. Um, these guys kind of nest in a lot of different types of places. Um, and they were everywhere from creeks in Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, the Poudre Canyon along the, the Cache Poudre River, the Big Thompson Canyon, and Bear Creek, which is down by Evergreen. And... Which things? The those orange and yellow things? Those are the mouths of the babies in the nest. There were five of them. Um, yeah, this was under a bridge. So this was actually 
um, along the Big Thompson River under one of the bridges, there was a, and, and same thing, the only way I found this nest was I heard them. Um, they, the babies, the parents, their, their call is so loud because especially during nesting season, the water is in spring runoff. I mean, so that river is flowing like crazy. Those babies have to tell their parents that, hey, you know, I'm okay or I'm hungry. They have to be able to have a loud enough call to actually be heard over the rush and, and roar of that river. But yeah, those are the babies um, that as the, when the parents come in, you know, that the mouths go open and it's kind of, it's, it's interesting to watch them to see which one winds up with the food. Um, I'll talk a little bit, I've put some dates in here. Um, so this nest was May 17th. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of the dates. So, so that year I started with nesting season. I started once I could hear the birds, um, once I could find them, the baby birds. But in hindsight, I kind of wish I had started before that. I wish I had started with the, the mating season and which then leads into nest building season, which then leads into sitting on eggs. So there's all these things, but these birds are, that's happening now. Um, but you don't, you know, it's snowing outside. You don't think of birds nesting other than maybe a great horned owl or a bald eagle. Um, so these birds actually start pretty early. Um, in February and March, you'll start seeing some pair bonding. Um, just the other day, I was along the Big Thompson um, near the golf course and saw one sitting out on a rock calling and singing. Um, I never did see the, the mate, but I did, you know, it was a very distinct, it was a very different sound than what I played for you earlier or what I would hear from, from babies. Um, so they're definitely talking to each other. They're building those pair bonds. They're defending territories. I have seen that as well, where one bird might be out in a rock and when another dipper comes in, that one is gone. It is chasing that one off. It knows it's, it's, it's territory. Um, and males do defend the territory most of the year. So if you see that like in October or November, that's probably a male bird. Although there's no real way, there's not much of a difference in appearance between the males and the females. Um, and I do tend to find the dippers you know, wherever they nest in, you know, late spring, early summer, I do tend to find um, birds kind of stay in the same, same vicinity. Now there's really no way for me to know if it's the same bird. Um, I'm kind of making an assumption with that, but I do tend to see birds in still in the general vicinity of the nests. So um, as I mentioned, you know, it depends on the weather. If, you know, for some of the birds that nest up at higher elevations, they may start nesting a little bit later. Um, this year we've had a ton of snow. So I, I suspect that the nesting season will might be a little bit later, but, um, but they are, they're hardy birds. They, the snow and the ice does not seem to bother them. Um, so the only exception of, so these are non-migratory birds. Uh, most songbirds do migrate. These are non-migratory birds. The only ones that do kind of change their general area are the ones that live in spots where it might freeze up throughout the winter. They do need to have open water to feed because they're an aquatic bird. They, they go into the water to get all of their food. So they do need to have access to open water. So some of those birds that might nest deeper in the park at higher elevations are gonna come down to some lower elevations for food. And as an example, this is the, this is Odessa Lake up in Rocky Mountain National Park. This is about 11,000 feet, if I'm not mistaken, just shy of 11,000 feet. And I have, this is the highest I've ever seen dippers. I'm not saying that's the highest that they go. They may go a little bit higher than that, but this is the highest I've seen them. Um, and there is a, a nest somewhat close to that area. So it's, you know, this is gonna be pretty well frozen over probably through at least, you know, May, late April. Um, so the birds that would be up there in the summertime would come down to a lower elevation um, during the winter to feed. So at this time of year, the, the mates are starting to sing to each other. You know, you can kind of listen for a, a, a different song, but still a very, very pretty song. Um, the breeding territories will start to form um, and then it takes two to four weeks to establish those territories. So those mates will spend time together. They'll actually start defending the territories, making sure they have their own space. And that's for feeding purposes to make sure that they have a big enough area so that they can, once they do have their nestlings, that they'll have enough of a, an area to get food for them without competing with other birds. So nest building starts one to two weeks after defending, after starting to defend the territories. Um, so you've got that two to four week window. Now you're starting to shift into a one to two week window to build the nests. Um, 
So the, the research I found was that nest start, nest building starts in March, peaks in April and extends into May. Based on the observations I've seen, I've seen nests as late as August. So I don't know if that's necessarily, um, and I'll get into why that may be, but um, they do kind of start now. I definitely have seen May, I would say like early June, I feel like for this area is probably a little bit more of a, a peak period. Um, but these birds may also have two sets of babies in one season. So that would explain the later August dates. So either if a nest fails and they try again, or if they've nested early enough to raise a brood, they could potentially have some time, enough time to have a second brood. Um, it is dependent upon spring runoff. We're gonna have a really big runoff this year. Hopefully the, the temperatures don't spike up and cause everything to just kind of flood out, but you know, it's a little bit more of a gradual thing. Um, but the elevation and the weather patterns are gonna have an effect on when, when the birds are actually nesting and the success of them. And, yeah. Those those dots. This this is just reflection off the water. So this is water and rocks. This is actually spray. So this is along a river, and the the spray spray comes up from the water. Um, and I actually did want to include that um, because these birds always nest near water. So they actually build their nests. I think it's actually the next slide. Um, no. But they actually do, um, they're always near water um, because that's where they get their food. But it also is a, a safety way for them to have their nests away from places where predators can't get to them. So this happens to be, I would say, maybe about 10, 12 feet above um, the Big Thompson River. So if you're on the other side of the river on a rock wall, and unless you can fly in, like maybe, you know, a, you know, a, you know, a raptor of some sort or something, there's no way for you to get up to that. Um, so they have a pretty good behavior in regards to nest building. Their biggest challenge is something like a 2013 flood that comes through that basically scours every single canyon from Fort Collins down to Denver. Um, you know, that can kind of have an impact on that. So, so early nest building, um, so one of the things, as I was going through the content for this presentation, one of the things that I, I found I actually didn't have was photos of nest building. Um, they start so early, I'm just not thinking about it yet. I'm not thinking about little birds. Heck, a lot of our songbirds haven't even arrived yet. So these guys, um, these photos were from a guy that, that puts out nest boxes. He actually builds boxes for dippers, um, particularly in places where um, you know, maybe the river has, has eroded away or a flood has come through or something's happened that has prevented the health of that, that waterway to actually give these birds a place to nest. Um, so he's actually putting these out now. And he says usually within a few days, um, last year, I think he said uh, within a few days, he actually had a, a, a pair of nesting. Um, so it, it, it's kind of crazy. They're, like I said, they're hardy birds in a very cold climate. So. Yes. So I have a 500 millimeter lens that I'm usually using my two, my 1.4 teleconverter on, which makes it a 700 millimeter lens. And then I'm cropping in in addition. So I'm usually sitting on the other side of the river. Um, I do have one photo, at the end of this, I have a little bit of information about how I capture some of these images, but yeah, these are long lenses. These are small birds. Um, obviously I don't want to disturb nests. That's you know, always something that's, that's very important to me um, to make sure that I'm not disturbing anything that's happening to them. So I'm usually on the other side of the river where I know I'm, my, my presence isn't going to disturb what they're doing. I see that in the photo. Yep. I don't know how high he places them, but this can give you a little bit of an indication to the water here, um, and then that nest box there. So it, you know, um, I think that it's supposed to. The, the poles could potentially make it possible that predators, you know, things like like I know raccoons can climb up, things like that. I'm trying to think of some of the other animals I've seen that climb out. Snakes can climb, but we don't have a lot of snakes here either. So, 
Um, but nests are always near fast flowing water. So waterfalls, streams, rivers, um, anybody familiar with what location, what waterfall this is? Have you been out here? This is Hanging Lake out by Glenwood Canyon. Um, but there's actually, I've seen a dipper nest behind this waterfall. Um, so there's a place that gets, you know, tons of people. It's, it's so popular with hikers that they actually have a reservation system there, yet the birds, birds nesting there and it's pretty inaccessible because it's behind the water and you can't get back to it. Um, nests are always, um, to find nests, look for them under boulders, ledges, um, bridges. I mentioned earlier that one photo that I had of the babies was under a bridge. Um, they're, the nest, and this kind of goes to your point, the nests will be high enough to avoid flooding. So they typically are about three to 32 feet above flowing water. So if you're putting um, a post up with a nest box on top of it, it's gotta be high enough that when that water level comes up, that it's not gonna get knocked over by flowing water or predators can't now get to it that where it might be. Um, but that's a good question, I can certainly ask them. And then this nest was photographed August 2nd. So to give you a comparison, that first one I showed you was May 17th with babies in it. This nest is August 2nd. And that's what I, that was my next question. Can anybody find the bird in there? Do you see the bird? So the bird is actually sitting. So this is the nest is under here. So the nest was under here. This is off to the left of the creek uh, or a river. Um, so the flow of the river here comes down this way. And then this, because it's flowing tall, this isn't actually above the, the rise of the water. Um, but yeah, that gives you an indication one how well they blend in. They blend in really, really well. Um, and then the, the spots where they have these nests are just kind of crazy. They're just, they're safe, they're secure, you know, they're, they're kind of out of the way. They're always near water, so they stay very wet. Um, this is a closer look at another, another dipper nest. They are two part structures built kind of in a dome um, if, if the space where they build the nest allows them to have that. So it's kind of, um, kind of rounded with an entrance hole. The entrance hole always faces out to the water. It doesn't matter if it's upstream or downstream, um, they can go either way, but they are always facing out to the water. The outside of the nest is kind of a harder shell. I've never actually felt one, but um, you know, when you look at it in photos, you can see what it's built, what it's made of is a harder, harder, you know, it gives it a little bit of security and kind of framing almost around it. And that's gonna be built of mosses, leaves, bark, twigs, algae, um, and that tends to stay very wet. Where the inside of the nest is a softer bed and it always stays dry. That outside is thick enough that it's actually gonna keep the inside dry. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty amazing way to build a nest. Where is the access hole? The access hole is right under here. That's the hole right there. This just happens to be grass. And now, the first thing over and That one, because it's under a bridge, is kind of a little bit more of a vertical nest. So yeah, so they're kind of up a little bit higher where the mother, um, let's go back to that one. So you can see, so this is the green. So like I'm kind of laying down underneath of it. I'm actually sitting there. Um, this is the green. And this is, so as you have on bridges, you have support beams that kind of go across. And then this is built in between that. On this one or the previous one? Yeah. So it's this here. I'm sorry, yeah, that for folks on Zoom, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so it's right here in the middle, that darker hole there. There just happens to be two pieces of grass that are kind of coming out, covering that up. And I, I believe I have another photo of this this nest with, with uh, chicks in it or nestlings in it. Um, so I mentioned that the, the nests always face the water, either upstream or downstream, and many nests have a constant spray of water on them. So this photo on the left of a dipper, she was flying, I'm assuming it was a she, she actually sat on this rock and then took off. Um, this is in Chasm, this is over by Chasm Falls. This is actually the water coming down 
um, who's at the Fall River in in that large chasm there, and she's flying up, and the nest was not too far from from that waterfall. Um, and then this is you can see, um, and I'll point it out for those on Zoom, and I'll point it out for those here in a minute. That little itsy bitsy yellow coming out from under that rock. Um, can you see that here? That's where the nest is. So that could be one of the babies coming out from under that rock. So I never did get to see the babies in this nest. Um, they were so tucked in there that, yeah, it was kind of, it was fun to watch. And I kept trying, I kept trying to find different, like, I mean, Nick's in here. I, I know Nick can appreciate, you know, you try to get the best viewpoint without disturbing anything and staying safe. I mean, these are, it's by water. Trust me, there have been many times I've been along the Big Thompson trying to photograph these nests and I'm watching the water and I'm like, please don't fall in. It just, you know, rocks can be slippery. This time of year, I have um, neoprene waders that I use and the boots are not, don't have, they have good grip on them, but they're rubber. So they tend to be real slippery on ice. I don't think that's what they were designed to be used for. Mm -hmm. um, so this is that same nest again. Now you can see one of the adults is peeking its head out. Um, so once the parents, once the female lays the eggs, um, they can have about four to five eggs is typical for them. And they take about 14 to 17 days to incubate. So not a very long incubation time, only a couple of weeks. Um, and then once those babies are born, the, the parents, both parents feed the babies, are doing constant feeding. Um, five babies in a nest. This is what they go out for. Um, I've actually sat with a couple of different nests to observe just how frequently they go to get food. My observations, I've seen it takes, it's about four or five minutes, they continue to come back. Now I can't quite tell if that's the same individual or a different one and they're kind of overlapping. Um, I don't very often see both parents at the nest at the same time. It happens, but not very often. But this is what they come back with. They come back with mouth, you know, just a mouthful of grubs and all kinds of insects and cat, you know, caddis flies and just all kinds of crazy things. But they do that for about 45 to 50 minutes. And then they seem to take about a 15 minute break um, where I don't see any parents coming back to the nest. Um, and then it starts again. And that happens all day long. So imagine how tired you would be um, to do that. So this time of year, I kind of see the same behavior, but now they're only feeding themselves. So they'll go get one bug. They go get, you know, they, they might not go as frequently, but it still seems to be about 45, 50 minutes. And then they take a little bit of a break, they'll preen. Um, so it's kind of a fascinating pattern to watch. The parents feed the babies with um, larva of caddisflies, mayflies, beetles, bugs, mosquitoes. They'll also um, get the, the adults of those bugs, as well as worms, snails, fish eggs, and small fish. And this is a little, this is a, a, a dipper that found a fish. This was down um, farther south, closer to Denver. Yeah, so they, that's a, you know, it's a good question. It's something I should look into as to exactly how do they, because they can swim down. I've seen videos. Yeah. And then years ago, they did not swim under the water. They walk diving off. Yes. Yeah, that would be a better description of it. So if you watch the videos, Audubon actually has a really good video on their website of a, a dipper diving into the water and they'll go. I mean, this time of year, I'm seeing them in pretty shallow water. Um, but when they're feeding babies, the water level is a lot higher. They'll dive down to the bottom. Yeah, and they do walk along. They can overturn rocks. Um, but I also see them floating along the rivers, too. I mean, they do float. They, um, they have a lot of oils in their feathers, which helps keep them dry. I suspect some of that allows air to kind of get trapped in their feathers and float, help them float a little bit, too. Um, that's a good question. Um, the nestlings are in the nest for about 20, so about 25 days, 24 to 26 days. Um, this is that same, the one, the nest on the right is that same one now that the parent is up a little bit farther. Um, both parents do feed the nestlings. I love this photo in the bottom left with the baby screaming behind, behind the bird. And she's just like, oh my gosh, you know, like again, really, I got to go out again. 
Um, and then I mentioned every four to five minutes for about 45 minutes, and then they take a 10 to 15 minute break. So, yes. Yeah, they do. Yeah, somehow they have to navigate through that water and the wings, just like our arms are going to be and their and their feet, but their feet are very skinny, so they're not going to have much um, traction against water. So they're gonna to have to use the wings to kind of push themselves. So, hmm? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that quite a bit. Um, so going from nestling to fledgling. So now they've been in the nest, they, you know, the eggs took about two, two weeks to hatch. Um, they've been in the nest just shy of a month. Um, now these little babies are, are gonna start venturing out on their own. I tried last year um, as the babies were, were fledging, I sat there and waited and waited and waited. I wanted to see what happened. Do they just kind of fall out? Do they kind of fly? Because they're going to, at that point, they've been strengthening their wings. I've seen that, but they're not going to be, that first flight's got to be really hard. And I never did actually witness. I mean, it almost seemed like I could leave for an hour. I'd come back and there'd be one out of the nest again. It's just like they would wait for me to leave. So I haven't seen that. Um, I would imagine it's probably all different kinds of things. You know, some probably do just kind of flop out some and then kind of float away. Some probably are a little bit stronger and can kind of get some loft so that they're not just falling out. Um, but the parents will continue to feed the babies. Um, the babies do come out one by one. I My observations are about two to three days, usually about two days. Um, it, you know, it doesn't take long, but they do come out one by one. And then the babies continue to stay in the area being fed by the parents, at least for a few weeks until they're strong enough to go out on their own. Um, so more, more, you know, more open mouths, more screaming, more, more begging for food. Um, and the parents continue to just kind of keep feeding them. So the, some pairs will re-nest if eggs are lost to predation or other causes if that nest fails and they don't actually have successful, successful um, fledglings. And if time allows, they could have a second brood, which I mentioned earlier. So, um, and I have seen nests as active as, as, you know, early to late August. So they're, you know, in, in, you know, at high elevations, that's pretty, that can get kind of, start to get kind of cold in the evenings, but at lower elevations, that's pretty, it's still pretty warm here in Colorado then. So that still gives these birds, you know, a good month, six weeks or so to, to build up before they, they are out on their own without their parents during the winter. So after nesting season, the birds become independent. I usually see them off by themselves. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the males will continue to defend their territories. So I see them chasing off other birds. They don't congregate together um, and they do remain, remain in the general vicinity of the nest. Um, so within Colorado, I've seen them up at about, this actually was at Brainerd Lake. I wonder if it was, this is an older photo. Um, this was taken at Brainerd Lake of a dipper along the edge of the water. Um, so I've seen them up about 11,000 feet. You know, Brainerd's, I think, 10,005. Odessa is just shy of 11,000. Um, and I've seen them as low as Clear Creek and, and Wheat Ridge in the fall. So this was taken actually just in December. And I've seen them as, as low as the South Platte River in Littleton in the winter. Um, so they, you know, they definitely have a pretty, pretty wide range of how there are elevations where they go. Um, so why are they called a dipper? We've talked about this a little bit already. If you've ever sat and watched one, and I do have a video in a second, um, you know, they just bob up and down. They sit on rocks and they bob up and down. They bob into the water, you know, in and out of the water all the time. Um, some research has shown that they can do that as many as 60 times a minute. That seems like a lot to me. But I guess if you're really sitting there looking at it, if they're sitting on a rock, I mean, you can get within a couple of seconds, you can get several bobs up and down. Um, and then the bird can also swim or dive or, you know, the terminology that we want to use for it to look for food and to turn rocks over um, to look under there. So this is that video. Hopefully this plays okay over Zoom. Sorry, let me turn that down.
up and down, up and down. And that's all they're doing. All they're doing is just constantly looking for food under the water. Um, so that's this one singing. That's the kind of that, that call that they're making out. More bobbing, more food, more bugs. See how quickly he picks up a bug and gets it right in his mouth, eats it right away. And these are all local. This was all in our general vicinity. And this guy takes off. So, sorry, I apologize. I, didn't, I forgot I had turned the volume up. <laughs> there we go. Um, so what is a water oozel? Um, American dippers were actually called water oozels at one time. Sometimes they are still referred to as oozels, but the, the, the Technical terminology, maybe not the technical, maybe technical is not the right word, but they are recalled American dippers now. The older term was water oozel. So oozel was another name for the common blackbird. And as people came over from Europe, that was what they were familiar with. Um, the dipper was considered to be similar in appearance, although I find them to actually be smaller than a blackbird, but I could see where that relationship would develop from. Um, but they would be found near water instead of in gardens. So that's where a water oozel rather than just an oozel which was the term for blackbirds. So if anybody says, so we have several places here. We've got Oozle Falls, Oozle Lake. That's all named after the dipper. Um, and then they have white. So if you ever watch them, they actually have white, what looks like a white eyelid. Um, and it is an eyelid, but it actually has, it's a layer of feathers on the eye, very, very, very fine feathers that are on the eye. Um, and it appears to flash when they're blinking. You'll see that as they open and close their eyes, you'll see that white flash. Um, but the, the purpose of it isn't truly known. There's some theories. Um, you know, one theory is that they use it as commu for communication. You know, when they're underwater, they can't call out. So it could be a way to kind of flash, you know, to either tell you know, another bird to go away. It's their territory or maybe to talk to a mate. Um, they're not exactly sure. Um, their the theory is also that the feathers could be there to help protect the, their eyes underwater when it's cold. So finding American dippers, start by looking near fast flowing bodies of water in the mountains. They do typically always live in the mountains. Um, listen for their loud song. That is usually a really good, usually that's something I listen for. Um, there are other animals that I do the same thing with. Pikas are another one that they can be really hard to spot when they're sitting still. Um, but if you listen for them, then you can kind of get a direction of where they're sitting. And pike or uh, dippers are the same way. Um, listen for that, that loud song. Um, and they do just blend in so, so well. Um, but, you know, look for them along the edges of, of creeks and streams and rivers. Um, you know, look for that movement. You know, so this one was, this was down um, in Waterton Canyon, uh, sitting out on a rock. So here's me and my waders. Um, I didn't quite get one of me sitting in the river, but, um, but I do have a pair of neoprene waders that I actually use um, to sit in the water because you want to get, um, ideally you want to try to get a photo as low as possible to connect with eye level. And these are tiny birds. So I want to be um, at their level within the water. That is my lens. So you can see that's a 500 millimeter lens. I do not use um, a tripod. Nick probably cringed at how shaky my video was. Um, but yeah, I don't use a tripod. Hmm? Oh, it's probably about 10 pounds total, 10, 10, 11 pounds with everything on there. Um, part of the reason I don't use a tripod in the water is that one, the rocks are slippery. Um, you know, rocks move and you have moving water over it. So I just really don't want to trust um, the stability of a tripod. Um, so I have really worked on hand holding the, um, that lens to do these types of things. But the, um, the I, and I do have that teleconverter on there too. The teleconverter sits between so for those on Zoom, the teleconverter is between the, lens, the end of the lens and the camera body. So I actually have, this is a, I have an adapter too, because this is a, um, a DSLR lens, but a mirrorless body. So I have two pieces in there. But that's what this, <coughs> these two components are my adapter and teleconverter. So, but yeah, that's me out in the, out in the middle of the river. People probably think I'm crazy. Some of those shots that I have on the ice and the snow, 
I actually was using those waders to lay down in the snow and actually be at at snow level. Yes. Oh, I've never heard that before. I don't know. I'm gonna have to write all these questions down. These are good questions. Um, are dippers colorblind? Um, I don't know the benefit of seeing color underwater. So yeah, that's interesting. That's a good question. Um, if you ever do go out to photograph, if there's anybody um, that's interested in photographing dippers, especially during nesting season, be very, very careful about water levels. So I like to photograph first thing in the morning. Um, that's just my preference. I, I think animals, I like the cool air. I like the, I think animals are more active then. Um, but water level is gonna be lower in the morning than it is in the afternoon. As the temperature rises over the course of the day, you're gonna get more snow melt falling into the rivers and it takes some time for that water to get from the higher elevations into the, into the streams and the creeks and the rivers. So I have definitely noticed that where I sit in the morning can be underwater in the afternoon. So it's something to consider. You don't wanna be caught in that. Um, so this is, so, so we're here with the Estes Valley Watershed coalition. And so obviously, you know, we need to talk about water. This is an aquatic bird. This bird always lives near water. They need healthy water. Um, so because of that, they're actually an indicator species for healthy water. If those birds are in an area, if they're abundant in an area, the water is typically healthy water. Um, their habit, their numbers have, however, declined in some of the range due to pollution, due to mining spills, due, there was a big project, or it might still be going on down towards the Durango area where there actually was a spill from a mine that affected um, a lot of the, the watersheds down there that has affected the, the numbers of, of dippers in the area. Um, silt is a problem, floods are a problem, and wildfires. These, this photo is, is showing, so the two images, the two jars of the big Thompson River one, um, I don't know if you're in the summer of 2021, there were a couple of mudslides that affected the Big Thompson River. One was below where that mudslide was. So that kind of came out from the Drake area and the other one's above that. So you could see the difference of how much soot and ash and all the, the crud that kind of gets washed down during those, those mudslides and those heavy, heavy rainstorms during a wildfire. Same thing with the Poudre River that summer. Um, they had a lot of problems up there with um, just the quality of the water. Um, but you can see like Bear Creek, Fern Creek, where where the fire, you know, Fern Creek was heavily impacted by fires too in 2020. So it's, um, you know, this was kind of towards, I think it was towards, well, it's actually a fall fall photo. So it was later in the season. Um, so that's something to really consider, you know, as you think about water quality and how we use water and what you put in the water, all of that kind of runs downstream and it can affect these animals. Bear Creek is down by Evergreen and Fern Creek uh, here in the park. So Fern Creek runs, um, Fern Lake was um, where the, the the camera, or not the camera peak, the East Troublesome Fire where that jumped over, that kind of fell, landed in that Fern Creek drainage. Um, it didn't burn Odessa Lake, but it started burning right below that all the way into uh, Marine Park. That's that drainage that comes down there. So if you look at Marine Park and you look up where all of that was burned, a lot of that's uh, the Fern Creek drainage. Yes. Mm -mm. No, they are a Western bird. Uh, and I do have, have some of that information. We, we're gonna talk about numbers of, of birds to give you an idea of their population in a moment. Um, the 2013 floods definitely impacted dipper populations. Um, a lot of that water scoured boulders and ledges used for nesting. So you know, that changed habitat. Um, to th that was a September flood. So it was kind of after nesting season. So it would have had a big impact um, over in the next year but it would have affected the water quality. It would have affected, you know, that's the time of year that babies are kind of out on their own for the first time. And now they have to go find food. And so floods had a big impact on the quality of water, probably a lot harder to find food. Um, and then the mudslides, you know, they, they, they definitely have an impact on, on what happens with, um, speaking of Brainerd Lake, I was actually at Brainerd Lake that day of that flood. Yeah, I was up there. It just started pouring and pouring and pouring. I was out photographing moose. Um, 
now, now that I think about it. So 2020 wildfires impacted the health of rivers in northern Colorado. This is a photo of the Poudre River in November of 2020, right after they reopened the road. Um, sediment, debris, and ash can run down river. There's a new study going on by a graduate student at CSU who is looking at snowpack. Um, and I thought this was really fascinating when we are thinking about dippers. They're so affected by water, the snowpack is where we get our water in our creeks and streams and rivers. Um, she is, there's two people studying um, the in burn areas, how is the burn affecting snowpack levels and when it melts? And what they're finding is that the snowpack actually melts. Um, I think it was one to two weeks earlier. If it, I don't, it doesn't look like I put it on here. I think it was one to two weeks earlier and it's a shorter because it's now melting faster. So what winds up actually happening is that these burnt trees have a lot, you know, all the outside of them has all been burnt. And as the snow falls on the ground and let's say you get a windy day, a lot of that, that black, that ash and broken pieces of burnt um, bark will fall on the snow. And now that, that absorbs more heat. So it then causes the snow under it to melt a little bit faster. There's also now a lack of canopy because the trees have been burned away. So more sun can get down onto that blackness on the snow that's now causing it to melt faster. And they're finding so far, they're finding that, that that's about a 10 to 15 year impact. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what winds up coming out of that study. I think they just started that last year. Um, but that can have, have impact. So that's now going to impact the timing for nesting season. If that water is flowing down sooner and heavier, um, it could either wash out nests that are in there, or it could make it difficult for finding food. Um, so it could mean that nests either have to be built earlier, or maybe they have to go later into the season. Um, it'll decrease the, the availability of nesting sites, and obviously I mean, clean water and food is going to be an issue. So we were talking, you, you had mentioned about the range of the American Dipper. They are a Western bird, but they can be found all the way from Alaska down to Mexico. So wherever there's, there's mountains, higher elevations, cold water, um, this is a year round range. As I mentioned earlier, they do not migrate. So this is, um, so it's a, it's a pretty, you know, long range, but very narrow. Um, it's just primarily in the Western, in the Western portion of North America. To give you an idea about their numbers, um, American Dippers, the world population is estimated to be about 160,000. Consider world population is in North America. They are only found here. Um, it's about 160,000. If you compare that to mountain bluebirds, think of how frequently you see a bluebird. Um, there are 6 million bluebirds, mountain bluebirds, um, and 2 .8, about 2.8 million stellar jays. Um, so I wanted to kind of compare these they all happen to be blue and gray birds, you know, bluish gray. So, um, but they're all local to our area. So they're all birds we're familiar with. And then some other birds that are much more ubiquitous, um, much more um, spread out across all of North America from West to East Coast. Um, European starlings, which are an invasive species in North America are 200 million. Um, and the American robins, 320 million. So you think of 160,000, that's not very many. Um, I actually expected that when I was looking up these numbers, I expected that to be quite a bit higher. Um, so, you know, as we, again, as we think of, of water quality, as we think of the things that we can do to improve water quality, not just for, for animals, but for people or vice versa, depending on how you want to look at it, um, you know, it has an impact on these animals too. So climate change will definitely continue to impact eco, um, aquatic ecosystems. So, you know, you, you know, do your part, you know, think about, where water comes from, think about conserving it, you know, think about what you put into it. Um, and I heard specifically the bird said, thank you for everything you do. So, um, so a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Water contamination is a big one. Um, I think the biggest thing, so as I said, there's one guy that's building, he's building some nest boxes and he's putting them out. I didn't realize that you could put nest boxes out for, for dippers. I didn't realize that they were a bird that would actually use those. So apparently that is, that's an option to kind of help them with some habitat. Um, you know, some of the other things that I, you know, that I could think of off the top of my head would be, um, you know, just obviously not disturbing them. Um, you know, one of the things with, 
I don't do, I don't do fishing, but I am very conscientious about my waders. I don't just use them here. Um, I use them in other places and you need to make sure that you rinse them off. You clean them off. You don't transfer mud. You don't transfer anything that could create an invasive situation in the water. Um, you know, things like an overabundance of an invasive fish might actually wind up then eating all the little bugs and other things that are in the water. And then it, it de decreases the amount of food. So that's something that I know is, um, you know, if you do fishing, you know, think about that, think about where your waders have gone, boats are the same way. Um, you know, if you if you have a boat, whether it's a rowboat, a kayak, anything like that, make sure you're cleaning that off and um, getting the water out before you put it in another body of water. And the color of the bag is no, they don't. Unfortunately, they don't use feeders. So that's, that's, um, you know, a mountain bluebird, you could put, you know, a, a bowl of mealworms out and they'll just devour that along with the Stellar's Jays and the Magpies and all the other birds that love that kind of protein. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, they don't use, um, and you definitely don't want to introduce, you don't want to just throw out, you know, what you think would be a good bug in a, in a water system. Um, because more than likely it's just going to flow downstream anyway. It's not going to have that. So yeah, it, it's a tough one. The water quality is going to be the biggest thing. The, the more that we can have water quality for them so that they can have the right habitat is going to be the big thing. Yes. I usually more so in the summertime, but um, I actually keep a bag in my car when I pick up trash, you know, just trash in general when I'm out, when I'm out walking my dog around the lake, when I'm out um, hiking um, in, you know, in parking lots in the park, any of that, because so much of that when it blows away, winds up in water. Water catches a lot of that kind of stuff. So yeah, anytime, you know, any, any little bit that we can help to pick up you know, always makes a difference. Yes. Do the users come back to the nest or they make a new nest? They reuse nests typically. They do reuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, this bird is one of those that does reuse their nests. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any offer I have for for spending time with with critters is always appreciated. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of reasons that can happen to that. Um, I mean, I've seen things like great horned owl nests be used for 20 years. And you know, great horned owls don't live that long, so you know it's multiple generations, and then all of a sudden it just stops. You know, so it's you know, a, a pair may may pass away, something may have been diseased in the nest, or maybe maybe they had. I've seen this with bald eagles, um, where if they don't have successful nests for a couple of years, they'll abandon the nest. They kind of you know something kicks in in their brain that just kind of says this isn't working. Um, so there, I mean, there's a multitude of reasons. But in that case, the nest is Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of, I mean, kind of like these, where's that one nest that, I mean, you know, like this nest, I mean, it's just, you can't even see it. I mean, you don't even see any grasses sticking out from it. It's not. Yeah. Hmm. 
Yes. In winter time, do they ever go into the nest for puppies? Um, you know they might. Um, I've I've been out. I've seen them out past sunset, but obviously they have to go somewhere um, for the evening. I would suspect. Most birds don't use nests in the winter time. I, I shouldn't say it's not all birds. Some birds do use their nests in the winter, um, but they're going to find someplace secure. I would think they would probably sit up, you know, back on some rocks or boulders or something, out of, out of the wind, out of the the weather. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Typically, they do. Um, you know, like some birds, they'll have. Um, you know, if, if one mate passes away, they'll find another mate or something. But yeah, um, research that I have read has indicated that the the dippers tend to, to pair back up with the same same mate again. There was a question on the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> so everybody's thinking great, thinking I like. So great questions. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of things that I have going on. I do have books with me tonight if anybody's interested in picking up a copy. Um, it's also available on my website if you'd rather order it that way. Um, you just, I love sh sharing my polar bear photos. Um, you know, everybody's always, we don't have polar bears anywhere near here. So it's always, um, I know people are always asking, they're like, how cold is it? I'm like, it's, you know, it's not too bad. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I do have. So these are the dates for this year. Mm -mm. Now we actually, we doubled the size this year, so. All right, yeah, let's talk. Um, the polar bears are a lot of fun. They, um, I, I've done some other presentations in town about the polar bears and it's just, they're so curious. You know, there, there's not, of all the animals that I've been around, there aren't many that that make me, what's the right word? Um, no, I don't want to use scared because I'm not afraid of polar bears, but but when you're around them, they're very, very curious. They're very, they know they're a top predator. They know there's very little that's going to stop them. Um, so they just, like we had one last year, it was a a, a, a teenager, I'll call him a teenager, uh, was coming up the beach and our guide, you know, we, we listen very carefully to our guides. And if he says to get in the car, get in the car. This bear was not listening to him. Usually if you start talking to him, they just kind of take a wide berth and walk around you and it's no big deal. This one just was not listening and he just kind of kept approaching our vehicle. And so we finally got in, but I couldn't reach the door to shut it. And I kept telling our, our local guide, I'm like, the door's not closed. The door's, the door is not closed. And all he's worried about obviously is making sure this bear does not get close to us. And he finally did have to shoot off a flare. He said that's the first time. And I think he's been up there for four years now. Um, that he's had to do that and that did the trick i mean it, you know they'll eventually make sure that they go away but they're just so curious they're just i've been on um i was up in Kaktovik, which is in northern alaska and we actually had um, a cub stand on the front of our boat um got real curious kind of like standing up in the boat but the the driver of the boat had beached had had it was kind of in the sand and he was trying to get it back out. And thankfully, mom must have been an older mom. And she was just like, whatever. She was just over to the side beating. But, um, you know, it's just, they're just curious. Most animals just don't want to, they don't want to be around you. They don't, I mean, even a little dipper, they don't necessarily want to be, they might get a little bit curious about you and kind of approach you a little bit. And then they'll usually fly off. Yeah, polar bears just aren't like that. So you can get some really cool photos of them. <laughs> um, but they're a lot of fun. And then I do tours here in Rocky too. So. Um, coming up on that season as well. Washington for bald eagles, um, night photography. I've really gotten into night photography um, more and more. You know, we're losing our night skies, kind of like healthy water. We're really losing our night skies, and um, I've taken a real appreciation for for what you. Hmm? <laughs> yep, yep. It's a. Um, a lot of women, and I shouldn't say a lot of women, I've met um, women photographers that won't go out at night by themselves. Um, now I have, my partner is a night owl, so thankfully he does like to go out, but then I tell him how cold it is, and he's like, oh, I don't feel like, it. so I go, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to be, have my wits about me and have good common sense about what I'm doing, where I'm going, so I can go out and do the things I enjoy. So I wanted to have, um, for night photography, obviously you have to be out at night. 
Um, a couple of the places that I go, I do hiking in. Um, so some people are nervous about hiking at, at night in the dark if they don't know where they're going. Um, so Devil's Tower is a place where um, there's no hiking involved, but it, it, it's remote. So you know, some people are just kind of a little bit nervous. I was like, well, let's get a group of win women together and you know, um, just have a really nice night out, photograph the stars. Um, last year I went up during um, went up a couple different times, but we have the timing that I have of it's during a meteor shower too. So we get the Milky Way and the meteors over, over Devil's Tower and stuff. So it's just, it's amazing. So has anybody ever gone out to photo, to look at the stars or photograph stars? Yeah. <laughs> um, the Milky Way season just started. Uh, March is always when, you, I shouldn't say the Milky Way season started because the Milky Way is always out there. It's the center, of the, the galactic center of the Milky Way is now back above the horizon and you can see it again. Um, so that lasts from about March to October. Um, and then as the summer progresses right now, it's kind of in a horizontal. And as the summer progresses, it goes a little bit more vertical before it goes horizontal again. Um, so. I was actually hoping this weekend I could get out to photograph it, but it's supposed to snow all weekend up here. So I might have to find another spot for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, you look out there and you just see so many stars, so many, and our cameras these days just do such a good job of picking up a lot of that detail out there. Um, it's just, you know, and it's just, you know, that's just another cool thing about living in Colorado. I grew up in New Jersey. I, you know, you could see the big dipper and that was about it. <laughs> um, you know, it's even worse. It, it's even worse now out there than when I lived there. And, you know, I was, I felt bad once I was in um, Shenandoah National Park in the fall. It was a beautiful night, crystal clear. If you've ever been there and you go up to big meadows, it's a wide open meadow, very, very dark. Here is Central. Um, Virginia. And um, this guy had this huge telescope and he had this group out in this field. And I'm looking and I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, that's not a very good sky. And I just, I felt so bad, but he, I mean, they were getting, you know, they were looking at this. And I'm like, you guys have to go out West. You have to go to Colorado or Utah. He's like, well, where do you live? I'm like, Colorado. And he's like, go away. <laughs> I'm just like, so, I mean, we got talking and we, you know, we kind of made light of it, but yeah, it's, um, you look at the night sky maps and, you know, and how much pollute night or uh, light pollution we're getting and how, I mean, even here in Colorado, it's spreading. It's, um, I used to go out to the Pawnee grassland and do a lot of night photography. And even out there, it's, it's dramatically different. Um, so it's, there's just, there's so much to see out there. There's so much beauty out there, whether it's a little, little bird on a river that we can see all year long, or, you know, the night sky that you can get out and, you know, and see what, what's out there for constellations and stuff. And so I could go on all night talking about different things. <laughs> Yeah, and that is it. I mean, most of us are from someplace else, right? Um, you know, just like I said at the beginning of the presentation, I came out here in 97, said I was gonna move here, did, um, and I will never leave, so. Um, You're a wonderful asset. Well, thank you. Um, so this is, so that was everything I had. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to her and thank you very much. Yeah, no, you're very <laughs> John's photography is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, so our upcoming events, as you can see, we're doing a snowpack uh, talk on flora and fauna and the changing climate. This is going to be a pretty big event. It's here. It's Saturday on <laughs> April 20th. 22nd. 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 Earth Day. Two to five. So that's our big Earth Day event. Uh, we really hope that you can join us here. Uh, Karen uh, Nidick and Stephen Fajnot will be the presenters there. And we'll have a kind of a big event with the Estes Valley School District as well. Um, the Environmental Club. So that's going to be really cool. Then we're going to be back here for our regular evening program on marmots in May. And then my husband Andy and I are going to present bears, black bears, in June, and then July, we're going to have a field trip. So we hope that you can join us for all of those events. And definitely, um, this page we uh, update frequently so that you can learn about our events. 
And if you're either on Facebook, you can look us up at EVWC Loves Wildlife. That's our Facebook group. Uh, or you can go on our website and we have a blog that we're starting to post some really cool information on. Um, we update that at least weekly. So you can join us there if you're not on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff the Don. Oh, yeah. Together. I'll take you up to that. <laughs>